Okay, we're going to get started. So good afternoon, everybody. I'm Adam Late. I'm the chair of the Department of Philosophy. And I'd like to welcome you all to the department's Julia Jean Nelson Rudd lecture on non-human animals. Uh, can you all hear me? Yeah. And Michael, can you hear me? Yeah. Wonderful. So just a little bit of background about this, about, about today's lecture. Uh, decades ago, James B. Nelson made a provision in his will for the IU Department of Philosophy to receive a large endowment after the death of his daughter and only heir, Julia. Upon her death in 1992, the money was deposited in a trust, and the department is able to spend the interest each year. Julia Jean Nelson was born in Greencastle, Indiana, attended Sweetbriar, DePauw, a girls' school in Berlin, and the Belcourt Seminary in Washington. Her lifelong interest was the prevention of cruelty to animals, and she was active in this field. She added a stipulation to the Nelson Endowment, saying that the department must sponsor a lecture each year about animals, non-human animals. <laughs> and this lecture has become one of our important annual lectures. It's a real pleasure today to introduce today's uh, Julia Jean Nelson Rudd lecturer, Michael Tomasello. Michael Tomasello is the James F. Bonk Distinguished Professor at Duke University. In which department, you ask? Well, he is quite stunningly Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience, Evolutionary Anthropology, Philosophy, and Linguistics. <laughs> To quote from the citation for the Heineken Prize for Cognitive Science, which he received in 2010, he is, quote unquote, one of the few scientists worldwide who is acknowledged as an expert in multiple disciplines. He is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the National Academy of Sciences, and in 2021 was awarded the Rumel Hart Prize by the Cognitive Science Society for, quote, significant contemporary contributions to the theoretical foundations of human cognition. Among other, among other things, he is well known for important research in comparative development and cognitive differences between humans and other primates, particularly differences in social cognition. Shared attention and shared intention play a central role in his theorizing, and this is one of the places where his work abuts contemporary work in philosophy of mind and action. Today, his talk will be on the evolution of agency it is hard to imagine anyone better placed to provide an empirically informed discussion of these issues. Please join me in welcoming Michael Tomasello. Uh, thank you very much, Adam. And thank you all for accommodating this uh, Zoom lecture because um, uh, I got a COVID shot yesterday morning and it knocked me out and there was no way I could get on an airplane. Uh, but I knew from talking to people that I should be better by today, and so we worked this out. And uh, so thank you very much for being understanding about that. Um, and thank you for that very nice introduction, Adam. So I was very happy to accept the invitation to speak about non-human animals to philosophers. Oh, sorry, I need this. I need to share my slides, my screen here. Sorry. Okay, can you all see that, see my slide? Okay. Uh, so I was very happy to accept the invitation to speak about non-human animals to philosophers. Classically, philosophers have not thought that animals were particularly interesting or important for their investigations. Notoriously, Aristotle thought that humans were the only rational animals, and Descartes thought that animals were nothing but reflexive automata. The majority of classical philosophers have believed that non-human animals are not even worthy of mention. However, it should be noted that for almost the entire history of, Western, of the Western intellectual tradition, thinkers were comparing humans to the only animals they knew, birds, foxes, dogs, and a variety of farm animals, with no knowledge whatsoever of humans' nearest primate relatives. Charles Darwin knew about other primates, <clears throat> And indeed, he interacted extensively with an orangutan named Jenny at the London Zoo, whom Queen Elizabeth dubbed disagreeably human. 
Darwin was so impressed by the similarities of great apes and humans, he came to believe that his theory of evolution would bring a new way of looking at human psychology, as you can see in this quote, and possibly philosophy. This possibility was central to the development of American pragmatism, whose main adherents could be considered both psychologists and philosophers, but they had very little data on the nature of animal cognition, which might be relevant to philosophical concerns about rationality, or on the nature of animal sociality, which might be relevant to philosophical concerns about morality. Early studies of animal behavior by ethologists and behaviorists were not helpful for these purposes, and indeed it is only in the last few decades, in my view, that we have made the kind of progress in the study of animal cognition and sociality that makes non-human animals relevant to philosophical concerns. I myself have spent the last few decades systematically comparing the cognitive and social capacities of human children with those of great apes. I will relate some of that research in the second half of my talk. But recently, I've also tried to dig back deeper into humans' evolutionary history as vertebrates and mammals, and to find even deeper continuities with a wider range of animal species. In doing so, I've come to the conclusion that the central concept that is needed, what I would call the first principle of psychology in general, is the concept of agency. Agency is the capacity of individuals to make informed behavioral decisions. Behavioral decisions are foundational for the evolution of psychology because natural selection can only see uh, action and actions and their physical implementations. So if you look here at these are some of uh, Darwin's famous Galapagos finches, they have different beaks, but they have different beaks because they have to do different things. The, the, the morphology of the individual is shaped toward the actions they need to perform. And the cognition and the emotions, all of the psychology of animals is selected, naturally selected at some level, but it's only selected indirectly via the effects on behavioral decision-making. Um, uh, I used to say something like, you know, it's not enough to know that the tiger is there or even to know what the tiger is planning to do. What gets naturally selected is the ability to use that information in action decision-making. Um, so I have a new book uh, where I try to uh, think about agency uh, from as pretty much as far back as you can go. Uh, and I, um, um, things like single cell organisms and all that, I just am going to leave that to the side because um, they are um, basically, fil a lot of them are filter feeders where they swim around and the food is already there. I'm more interested in um, uh, behavioral decisions. And so I start actually with vertebrates in general. And it turns out that um, the earliest vertebrates were lizard-like creatures. So I start with lizards. Um, all of my colleagues think it's hysterical because I've never, I've never gone back that far. I've just gone to great apes. But anyway, I found it extremely useful. And to think about agency in an evolutionary perspective, we need to make a fundamental distinction. And one, the first part is psychological content. So animal species have all kinds of specific adaptations. This is the stuff of natural selection. This is what you read about in behavioral ecology textbooks. They evolved to deal with predictable challenges in the world. Spiders building spider webs, uh, uh, squirrels caching nuts, chimps using tools. These are all things that have evolved. Evolved doesn't mean there's not learning during ontogeny going on. It just means these are capacities that have evolved. And they can be quite complex, like a spider building a spider web. And there are just millions of them. I'm focused on something different, the psychological organization. Uh, so the subtitle to my book is Behavioral Organization. Psychological organization. And there, what I mean is the architecture, if you will, uh, for behavioral decision making. And for that, I actually came to the conclusion. Uh, I didn't have this conclusion, this conclusion in mind before I started, but I came to the conclusion that there are really only a few types. And you can be a lumper or a splitter. And so maybe they can be split down into some subtypes. But I think there are three main types. 
Now, why did agency, in terms of behavioral decision-making, why did it evolve? And the answer that um, uh, a lot of people imply, but I think most people, I, I don't think it's been as e explicit in the literature as it could have been, is it evolved to deal with uncertainties. So take, for example, um, a squirrel getting ready to cash nuts. Squirrels are evolved. They're hardwired, if you will, to cash nuts. All of them do it all over the world all the time. However, at a given moment, a squirrel has a nut in its paws and is trying to make a decision where to cash it at this moment. And there's a novel landscape that evolution can't predict. Or if an animal is trying to find uh, water, it's going to be water in its local environment. And natural selection cannot um, uh, build in knowledge of that local source. So natural selection selects for a type of psychological organization in which the individual can deal with these situations, these situations that are unpredictable from the natural selection's point of view, to deal with these uncertainties by making flexible decisions that are informed by their perception and understanding of the situation. And the decisions are under individual control. Now, that's a, that's, this is an, um, an important point that uh, uh, philosophers of action and, 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 and uh, psychology, uh, I think, might be interested in and might contest. Um, I believe you have to have the individual agent making those decisions. And I'm not worried about homunculi or anything like that, uh, but I believe that the first principle of psychology is individual decision-making. Otherwise, you only have biology. You don't have psychology. You only have psychology if you have individuals making informed decisions. So that's the proposal for a dividing line between the biology of behavior, which is about reflexes and about things that are really hardwired, um, such a, uh, and things where the individual has to make uh, a flexible, informed decision on the spot. So if we're thinking about that kind of um, individual decision-making, um, I wanna look at the evolution of it. And what I do in the book is look at four types, four steps, if you will, four types. And this is not a scala natura, but a, an actual historical sequence or a proposed one. So around 350 million years ago, the first vertebrates, as I mentioned, uh, people have speculated that they were like lizards. So what we need is a model species if we want to look at um, um, uh, behavioral evidence, if we want to look at experiments, uh, we need a model species for this. And so naturally, since they were lizard-like creatures, I'm going to choose a lizard. So there's a lot of pretty good behavioral data on lizards' cognition and social behavior. About 200 million years ago, one type of vertebrate uh, were mammals. And of course, humans are vertebrates and they're mammals. So we're mo moving up to humans in an evolutionary historical sequence. Turns out the first mammals uh, were are described by many people as squirrel-like. Uh, we also have a lot of information on rat uh, uh, behavior and cognition. Uh, about 20 million years ago were the first great apes. I'm skipping primates in general because the data aren't clear. I hate where there's a lot more good data on great apes, but this may, the correct um, choice here might be primates in general, but I'm going to go with great apes because I'm sure of that. Uh, and uh, there we can take any one of the four great ape species, four non human great ape species as a model species, and I'm going to take chimpanzees. Um, not because they're necessarily better model species, but because it's the one we know the most about. And then we know a good bit about human or humans earlier in evolution as well. So these are my model species. And I want to look, um, and, and again, this is, a, this is an actual historical, proposed historical sequence, not a scala natura going from, uh, you know, uh, uh, good to bad or anything like that. So I want to look at each of these four very briefly, and I, uh, each of the first three very briefly, and because I assume that um, uh, philosophers are most interested in humans, 
uh, I'm going to spend the better part of the time on the human case, which is the one that I actually have studied myself more. But I want to give uh, I want to I want to give the background here. All right, we have to make a distinction if we're going to talk about behavioral decision making. We have to make a distinction between things that um, a lot of psychobiologists call stimulus driven things, where the organism is built to react. So in the human case, we can think about reflexes. We can think about breathing and swallowing and sneezing and all kinds of things that are stimulus driven. Newborn infants are born with some reflexes that they don't have control over. They, they, they automatically produce them when um, uh, the, the, the appropriate stimulus presents itself. Now I understand there's a, there's a gradation there, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a sharp cut. Uh, between um, stimulus driven, which is basically stimulus response. Um, the, the, the classic um, studies in, that started behaviorism were Pavlov's studies of Pavlov's dog, which is reflexive stimulus response. They, uh, and and um, uh, I would say that the causal model here the causal model is like the physical world. It's like cause and effect, linear cause and effect. But the natural world doesn't work like that. The natural world, or at least it, not totally like that, I should say, the natural world, we have homeostatic mechanisms. We have uh, homeostasis in the body uh, regulating the temperature of the, of the body. We have homeostatic mechanisms uh, regulating the sugar level in the blood. So, um, one of the great advances in psychology, in my mind, is the classic models of people like Miller, Galanter, and Prebrum, their famous book on plans and the structure of behavior, uh, because there we're saying, no, we don't have a linear physical causality stimulus response organization. We have a circular cybernetic control system organization. And the classic example is, of course, um, the thermostat. Uh, where um, we the out the goal is set by the human, uh, but of course, if you make an analogy to evolution, we can have this goal set by evolution. So we have a goal of of having enough food, of feeling sated. Uh, we don't create that goal ourselves; that's given to us. Um, and then um, we uh, look to see, you know, we, 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 we perceive the world and see what we need to do to fill our hunger. And uh, then we uh, see what we need to do. We act. And then that action changes the environment. And then that feeds back. And we say, oh, have we met our goal yet or not? So you have this circular uh, organization. Uh, just to make it just to make it really clear, um, uh, uh, the thermostat um, is a control system, so it operates on its own once the goal is set. And just the, the stimulus response version would be something like a fan, which you turn on when you're warm, but you're not, the, the fan is not sensing the room, the temperature of the room, and it's not um, uh, comparing, uh, it doesn't have a goal that it's comparing to the temperature of the room. It's a linear turn it on, it goes on. It's a stimulus response uh, machine. And the same with a space heater that you plug in and just turn it on. The agency, the, 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 the machine model of agency is the self-regulating machine, the machine that has goals, regardless of where they come from, and that then acts autonomously, independently to um, match the environmental, the environment as perceived to the goal, and then choose, make a decision for an appropriate response. Now, I don't want to get into uh, whether machines are really agents or whatever. I, 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 usually, I usually speak to psychologists, and they, they're not concerned about that. But anticipating philosophical concerns, I don't know whether a machine is an agent or not. But the point is that the machine is created to model an agent. right? And so that's why we think it's, that I want to use that as the model. And I think that's also going to solve a lot of our homunculus kinds of concerns that people have when I say the individual organism making decisions is necessary uh, to think about psychology at all. And I want to, I'll draw an analogy in the philosophy of biology. There was a time where uh, many biologists thought that living things had a special elan vital, a special kind of substance or energy 
uh, that non-living things didn't have. And this was serious. This was a serious proposal all the way into the 20th century. But we discovered that no, it's not that living things uh, have a different substance or different energy in them. It's the same old chemicals you see everywhere else, but they're organized in a special way. Right? And I want to say that that's what I think the, the machine model, the control system model helps us to see is that we can model agency uh, not by uh, having a special homunculus or a special cognitive organism in there duplicating the organism. No, it's the organisms functioning as organized in a certain way, organized like a control system where the, where the individual has a goal and makes decisions about how to make the environment match their goal. Okay, so again, there, there are creatures that may or that may or may not be agents. I'm thinking about you know single-celled organisms and you know various uh, um, low-level things. Um, and I'm going to start with a case that I believe is clear from the behavioral data. And these would be the earliest land vertebrates. Uh, I will use as my model uh, current day uh, lizards, about 350 million years ago, and they needed to evolve to. Um, deal with the uncertainty presented by their major prey, which is insects. And again, your single-celled organisms are swimming around with an open mouth, just ingesting whatever algae are, are in the area. But what these guys had to do was capture things that themselves are uh, animate, if not agents. I'm, insects are off to the side, so I'm leaving them aside, but they're, but they're unpredictable. So they're hopping around and flying around and trying to evade you. And so um, natural selection cannot equip the individual lizard with the ability to, uh, with, with a hard wiring that tells them what to do in every single case of every insect in every environment. They build them with the capacity to judge the situation with the uh, insect and to take the appropriate actions. Um, in reviewing the literature on lizards, um, I decided to call them goal-directed agents, and that this and this is going to be my lowest level agents, as it were, my most my simplest agents, and they make only go no go decisions. Uh, I'm not going to give you all the data; I, it's in the book, uh, but uh, I, I just want you to take my word for these conclusions, and you can ask me about the the uh, studies and the data later um, if you'd like. Um, so they make go, no to go decisions. So an individual lizard comes out of the burrow and says, uh, should I go there? Yes, no. Uh, I, see a, I see something moving over there. Should I go? Yes, no. So it's just a yes, no decision. It's not an either or um, weighing of a value-based decision as they're called in cognitive science. They do have what is often called in cognitive science, global inhibition. So if they're in pursuit of a, of an insect and they see a snake, they can freeze. And so that's their one sort of executive function. And I, I actually don't want to call it, I, I argue in the book, I don't want to call it an executive function, but it's the precursor of executive function. It's global inhibition. Stop what you're doing. And then when the coast is clear, you can make another go, no decision. So they make a series of go, no, go decisions. And that's basically their psychology. Um, now, I do want to point out also, and this is, a, this is a point that I believe should be of interest to people studying the philosophy of mind and the philosophy of action, we perceive all kinds of things. I'm perceiving all kinds of things in the room now, uh, but I'm not attending to them because they're not relevant for any of, for my, not only for my immediate goal, but for any of my concerns. Uh, the color of the carpet is not in any of my concerns. I'm not attending to it. So I want to say that in agency, per perceptual capacities are a background, but uh, the key thing is attention. If I have a goal, I attend to things relevant to my goal. And I should say goal, people think goal, I don't just mean goal direct actions, but also values in general. Pro-attitudes, I think, is the most general term, right? So my goals, my values, my aspirations, my desires, all of the pro-attitudes, I'm attending to things relevant to those. Um, and what is relevant to those is situations. 
So um, you can imagine um, uh, the, the lizard, the lizard moves toward a little bush, say, and the image on the lizard's retina is, just imagine a picture here. I've got the bush, I've got an insect in the bush, and I've got a snake off in the distance. That's the image on the retina, All right? So he's perceiving that image. I would say that the lizard can attend to the fact that there is an insect in the, in the, on the branch, and the fact that that branch is climbable, the fact that there is a, a snake over there, the fact that there are no good escape routes, and make a decision uh, based on the various things that it can attend to. Um, uh, I argue in a previous book of mine that um, uh, they perceived situations uh, the fact that this is the case or that is the case because the goal is like that. And this is a point that is made by Davidson in some of his work on the on action theory that uh, the goal is not, my goal is not the apple. My goal is having the apple in my hand or eating the apple. The goal is an activity, an event, a situation. And so goal, what's goal relevant is situations in the environment, fact-like situations. And I have argued before that people who uh, think that propositional thinking is coming from language have got it wrongly ordered. Uh, this is a, um, a precursor to propositional thinking in the sense that it is focusing an entire situation with different entities and their relations. Uh, and that's what, it's, that's what we attend to when we're pursuing a goal is uh, fact-like situations relevant to the goal. Uh, I, I do want to acknowledge that uh, the situation is much more complicated than just this single control system. So actually, what the lizard would have to do is, if you look at a little series of uh, control systems, he's got a stomach, and the goal is for it to be sated, and if it's full, he stops, and if it's not, he uses his eyes to look around and see if there's anything, and if he finds it, he has to move his limbs and go over there, uh, and if he goes over close by, then he has to capture it in his mouth and eat it. So actually, um, this is another way the behaviorism is so awfully misleading. They think about these sort of punctate stimuli and responses. No, the natural behavior is a complicated uh, uh, set of control systems. Uh, and each one of these four components actually has more subcomponents in terms of actually how to move limbs and stuff like that. But in any case, uh, this is the simplest sort of um, control system that we get in vertebrates, um, uh, in my opinion. Now, if we move up to early mammals, I want to call them intentional agents, and I mean intention in the sense of an action intention. Um, and early mammals uh, had a new set of uncertainties to deal with. Uh, lizards and other reptiles are mostly solitary creatures. They're mostly born out of eggs, and so they're they're not social, uh, very social at all. Um, and uh, but the early mammals lived in social groups mainly, and uh, this means they have to compete with others in their group. So that means if you're going to get food, whatever it is, um, uh, you have to do so more quickly and more efficiently than your group mates. And this is sometimes called scramble competition. The fastest gets the spoils. Um, and so early mammals on the line to humans, again, I'm not talking about birds and insects because they're off the line to humans, but on the line to humans, early mammals are the first ones to really engage in this kind of scramble competition, which makes them have to make quicker and more efficient decisions. So the proposal here is that now we get a new tier and I'm thinking of an architecture where the basic action attention level is what the lizards are already doing. And we get an executive tier of decision-making and cognitive control. In the diagram, DM means decision-making and CC means cognitive control. And now we're getting cognition, knowledge, values, et cetera. But what we can see in these creatures is we can see them um, imagining sensing action plans. I have a book on the evolution of uh, thinking, a natural history of human thinking, and there I argue that in a, in, 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 in a basic definition of thinking, creatures like this are thinking. That is to say, they see a problem situation, maybe it's a, maybe it's a piece of food somewhere out the limb or something, and they imagine 
uh, what would happen if they did this and what would happen if they did that. So I actually, I, I, my, my, my office at home, I looks out on some trees and you see a squirrel on a limb going like this, you know, trying to decide whether to leap to another limb. And I saw him, you know, right back when I was writing this, actually, and, and starting looking like he was going to leap and then finally walking down the limb, down the trunk of the tree and then up the other tree. So he's deciding between um, um, he has this executive tier and he's making an either or decision. Should I do this or should I do that? And to do this, to, to engage in this, he has to imagine things that are not currently in the perceptual world. All right. It's what would happen if I did this? What would happen to the world if I did this? What would happen to the world if I did that? These are what are sometimes called in cognitive science value-based decisions. So this looks like it's the best bet. This one looks like it might lead to failure. And so in this either-or decision, they have to develop something more than global inhibition. Um, they get they, what's called inhibitory control, which is a more flexible um, inhibiting the decision that's not chosen and promoting the decision that is chosen. This kind of planning, action planning, um, also allows you to um, form intentions. That is, you say, okay, I think this, this, this way of doing it would be better than this way. Okay. And now the intention to do it is formed. And um, um, uh, this can also involve organizational, um, uh, 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 the, what in human infants is often thought of as the operationalization of intentional action, removing an obstacle. So, so uh, you, there are studies showing that, that squirrels and um, rats, for example, if there's an obstacle in a way, they can disengage from the goal, from the ultimate goal, and stop and move the obstacle and then proceed directly to the goal. So this is in, in, in human infancy research, this is the operationalization of an intention uh, that um, you have the goal in mind the whole time you're doing something else. You're only moving the, removing the obstacle because you have this other goal. So, um, so, you're in, uh, so, so you have this um, embedded one sub procedure embedded in another, and this is intentionally organized um, uh, action. Um, and so, and again, that's a much more flexible way of doing things. And this is all based on your decision making. I use the word from the beginning here. I use the word informed decision making. So this is all based on your assessment, the the individual's assessment of the situation at hand. Okay. And now I want to talk a little bit about apes, who I've done a lot of research myself, and I understand the word rational um, <laughs> raises all kinds of issues for. Uh, uh, philosophers, uh, and uh, the word rational is used in so many different ways. I need to specify uh, what I'm talking about here. Uh, the very thinnest use of rational is in economics, where it just means, um, you know, sort of making self-serving decisions that are effective, and I mean more than that. I may not mean as much as a lot of philosophers mean of um, uh, normatively governed and all that sort of um, um, you know, rational norms and all of that. I don't mean that. What I mean is maybe you would prefer to call it reflective decision making. Uh, so early apes started engaging in contest competition. And this is different from uh, scramble competition. Scramble competition is just the fastest one gets it. But contest competition is I have to outsmart my competitor. Um, and so they had to do a lot of new things. And I believe that uh, they had to, in, to evolve a second reflective tier. I also sometimes call it a metacognitive tier of decision-making and self-regulation. And the rest of it looks just like uh, uh, the mammals in general. So they just add this tier on top. I should mention as well, because this paves the way to humans, that our research with great apes, and I have lots of things written on this, uh, shows that they understand causal relations in the external world, and they understand intentional relations. They had a very simple theory of mind. I don't like the term theory of mind. I, I tend to avoid it. But they understand others as agents. Not only are they themselves agents, they understand others as agents. And they understand the causal structure in the external world. But understanding the intentional, understanding others as agents 
is going to be critical because that's going to lead us to humans here. And I first want to just um, uh, show one experiment that, that will transition us from apes to humans a little bit here. Now, here's why I'm calling them rational. We have a recent study that worked as follows. Uh, so the ape and five-year-old children were also in this, but let's just stick with the apes. The apes look at panel one, A over there, and they see two pieces of food, and one of them is bigger than the other. Now, this is actually a trick because we have magnifying and minimizing, minimizing lenses there, okay? So one of them appears bigger and the other one appears smaller. Now, panel two, B, we shift around and he's looking through the side now, and now we have switched the maximizing and minimizing lenses, and now the other one looks bigger. Now, the dependent measure is not which one the animal chooses, but we wanna know, have we raised doubts? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I skipped one essential detail. Go back to panel one. They see that the one on the left is bigger and they have to choose it. They have to make a decision. So they put their hand out showing this is the one they want. Now it's flipped. So they've made a decision, but now they have evidence to doubt their previous decision. And the measure is whether they lift themselves up and climb up, they have to climb up the caging like a couple of a meter or so and look down into them to check and see which one it is. And the apes do this. So they are questioning their original decision based on new evidence. Um, in, in, the, in the human children's literature, this is often called belief revision. But in any case, uh, I would call this reflective. If you don't like the word rational, that's fine. I would call it reflective decision-making. Now, here's where we get the transition to, um, to children uh, in the comparison to humans. Um, now we have a variation on this theme. So we have two apes. You can see them here. And the, the one we're interested in is, is on the left. And he has already chosen. He's looked in the boxes, seen what looked biggest, and he chose, let's say, the, the one on the right. He chose the one on his right. But now, before he gets it, we slide it across to another ape. And the ape is trained ahead of time. He's a stooge for us. He's trained to choose the other one. So now he has the, the, the subject has reason to question his decision because somebody else chose a different one. But now when you bring the choice back to him, the chip chooses his original one almost every time. Never questions it, never looks to see. Three-year-old children will check. Three-year-old children, if they chose one of them and another child across the way seems to have chosen another one and you bring it back, the children raise themselves up and check and double check on their decision. So here is an agentive decision process, procedure, where we can really see a difference between the apes and the humans. The apes stick with what they know. They don't care what other people think. Now they can reflect on their own thinking, but they're not they're not um, checking, they're not revising their belief based on what other people believe, seem to believe, uh, but the children are. So this transitions us to um, a concept um, that I borrowed from philosophers, from uh, Michael Bratman and uh, Margaret Gilbert and uh, John Searle, and I know um, um, uh, um, your own Kirk, um, I'm sorry, I'm having name finding problems, but uh, you know who I'm talking about. Um, um, sorry, somebody say his name. Ludwig. Yes, Kurt Ludwig. Sorry, very, I'm sorry very much. I'm a, I, um, in my 70s, I've had nine, name name finding problems. Sorry about that. Uh, Kurt Ludwig, uh, uh, who's talked a lot about shared agency as well. And um, um, uh, I have made the distinction, which also fits quite well with uh, some of Kirk's about joint agency. He has two volumes in his in his uh, in his um, two volumes, which one of them relates to individuals having shared agency with one another, and the other is collective agency, which is a group-minded agency, which involves you in norm uh, in in conventions, norms, and institutions, and things like that. Um, I think joint agency um, evolved about a half a million years ago where they really could have shared goals, shared intentions, 
shared attention to things of a type that other creatures don't have. So great apes, they do do some things together, but they don't form a joint agency. And I have lots of evidence. I'm going to present a little bit of it to you here today uh, to show that that's the case. And collective agency is icing on the cake, is uh, um, um, uh, uh, making group decisions and having uh, common knowledge among all in the group, cultural common ground, it's sometimes called. Um, and uh, so I think there are actually two steps in the human evolution for this shared agency. Um, and it, it, it assumes the rational agency of apes that's already developed, uh, but now you're putting your heads together and forming uh, a, a joint or a collective agency. Again, I know there's a deep philosophical question about the status of these uh, shared agencies, and Kirk has a lot of um, uh, thoughts on, on that. Um, he tends to take a more individualistic approach. Other people take a more holistic approach. I am going to stay neutral on that for the time being. I'm happy to talk about it if people want to ask me about it. Um, and what I have uh, taken advantage of is the fact that anything that is, evolves in human ontogeny I'm sorry, anything that evolves in human evolution, you should be able to see that adaptation emerging in human ontogeny. So I have a 2019 book on becoming human, which is on ontogeny, and I propose that um, this joint intentionality or joint agency, uh, those capacities emerge at around nine months of age, and the capacities for collective intentionality uh, and group mindedness emerge at around three years of age. And I marshal 400 pages of evidence for this proposal. And I look at a bunch of different cognitive domains, collaboration, pro-sociality, social norms, moral identity, social cognitive communication, cultural learning, cooperative thinking. And I show transitions in each of these domains, one transition at nine months uh, that looks, it's more about shared intention, about joint intentions, and another one at three years that's more about collective intentions. So let me give you a, um, a, 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 a just a very a very quick um, feeling for the nine month revolution. So uh, this was my daughter. This is a home movie. Sorry, on the left here, uh, my daughter's nine month birthday, and I was you know say you know I actually coined the term nine month revolution, so I thought we should look at it. We have the sibling on the phone, and we're going to do a collaboration. So we're I want to play a ball rolling. So she rolls the ball back and I'm just absolutely flabbergasted. Now watch where she's looking. She looks up at my face. So we're really sharing this activity. So see, she looks to my face. That's it. That's going to be important, All right? She rolls it back. It, it, it kind of comes back to her. And now she, she looks to the face, All right? So we are sharing this activity. It's a real collaboration. Now look at the bottom. This is a communication. This child's about 14 months, I think. Um, and this is the way humans communicate in unique ways, well before language. We're just sharing, okay? That's all. The only motive here is, isn't this cool? Isn't this interesting? And you may say, oh, that's a cute little 14-month-old motive. I would say we humans communicate like this all the time in our gossip. Did you see that World Cup game last night? Did you hear who got divorced? We are just sharing things just to share them. Right? And finally, the classic joint attention condition uh, situation, book reading, you watch mom is pointing to something, the kid's looking at it. Uh, this is her ninth birthday, too. You can see she has the same clothes on. Uh, but now watch where she looks. She, look, she doesn't just look at the picture mom is pointing to, but she looks to mom's face because we're sharing it. And then she actually points herself, and she actually says something like baby, and we all get excited, of course. All right, now compare this to a chimp. This is a human raised chimp. Her name is Annette. Now the human is trying to get her to play with the ball, right? And she gets, she takes the ball and she bounces it. Okay, and now Annette, Annette is going to be interested in the ball, but she's not interested in playing with the human and the ball. So not any kind of collaborative or triadic activity of the two of them Sharing the tension and sharing the goal with respect to the ball. So you can see she's doing the ball on, on her own with the ball. Now we're going to quick cut. We're going to do the book. And she's very interested in the book, the pictures. But of course, she's not turning around and looking at the human, not praying for the human, or anything of that sort. So that's meant to give you just kind of a flavor that from nine months, 
the infant is doing things that we have characterized as triadic. Um, uh, me, you, and the thing we're jointly attending to. Me, you, and the game we're playing together. Apes interact face-to-face, -face, and you could call it cooperation, but they're not joining together to pursue shared goals. Now, if we want to look at um, collaboration a little more uh, detail, this is a little uh, experiment. This is actually um, a, a little 18-month-old, and the game is you roll it down here, and it makes a noise. You can see he's enjoying this. And he starts to put it down here. Now look, he teases. Okay, look, look at his face. He's teasing. And then knows he needs to put it down here. So he coordinates. Now the experiment is that the experimenter is going to stop. Now what does the kid do if the, if the experimenter is not playing his part? Okay, come over here. You know, you're not doing your thing. Come over here. So he wants the, the human to play his role over here. Okay. And now they get back to it. Um, here's another, this is actually a study. This is a pilot we were playing around with. And this was a study on helping. Okay. And so the puts away the book, the magazine. And this is an 18 month old. And now we're going to see what happens when the adult has a problem. And now he helps, but watch, here's the part for, that I want to focus on here. He points. He says, there, they go there. So he's telling the partner how to play his role. Look, see, he points and looks at his face. They go there. Yeah, it's just... Coordinating this activity with cooperative communication, cooperative communication, and helping you play your role. Give him information. Now, whereas before, the little 18 month old waited till the adult had a problem and then helped. Now, having done it only one time, this is a novel activity. He opens it up in anticipation of the problem and again tells him, put them there. They go there. Now, you could give a normative gloss to this. Okay. Oh, yeah. the, the child is saying, they go there, or you ought to put them there. I believe that's too rich. And we have experiments showing, I think, that it's not till three that it gets a normative gloss. But he certainly says, um, you know, I know what your job, you know, I know what you're going to do and, and helping them to do it. So it's at least it's helping. Um, now, by the time they get to be about three, here's the transition uh, to where we can have a joint commitment. Uh, th these little girls are putting it the thing. There are there are um, buckets on each side and each of them has rewards in it, but we have rigged it so that one girl is gonna get her reward first. So they've started the collaboration. Um, uh, sorry, they've started the collaboration. And the girl on the left is actually gonna get hers first. She doesn't go cashing in. She has to, you'll see in a minute. She has to go cashing in. And she pauses, comes over to see the problem that that part is stopped up for that girl. That's good. And so she goes back and finishes it off. Now the girl gets hers. And now they go. Uh, if some of you may know the philosopher Michael Thompson, he saw this um, video and he said, you know, it's not that that girl's being nice or helpful. It's that the activity isn't over yet, all right? Because we were doing it collaboratively. And if you haven't got yours yet, it's not over. Chimpanzees, we have a situation where they work on something together. Um, and uh, as soon as one of them gets, a, gets his reward, he's done. It's over. He doesn't stay with the other guy to get his reward. So we say when they're collaborating, and you're going to see a video in just one second of chimp collaboration, uh, they're using the partner as a social tool is the way we uh, characterize that. But let me show you one more with the kids first. Uh, so this is an explicit joint commitment. You don't catch these that often, but this is an activity where if they pull to one side, I get a reward. If you pull to the other side, you get a reward. And now the question is, whose side do we pull to first? And can we work out an equitable arrangement? If you look at the graph, most of the children figure out um, a, a way, the, 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 the red part is taking turns. Most of the children find a way to take turns. 
chimpanzees, we tried three different things and none of them could find a, a way to take turns. But in addition, some of the children did this. They're trying to negotiate who is going to uh, um, go to their side first. Who, whose side are we gonna pull to first? Now, luckily in German, the word here is here. And you're gonna see them say here, meaning to my side, here, meaning to my side. And then you'll see what they end up doing in the end. Okay. There's your joint commitment. Okay, we can pull it to your side first, but that only if you promise me we're pulling back to my side on the next time. So they form a joint commitment, a Margaret Gilbert-like joint commitment to do this activity together. Um, and, and in this case, under the condition that um, uh, uh, we will come to my side afterwards. Um, and now here's some chimps collaborating. So what will the chimpanzee? So I want to show you the motivational side of things, the more socio-moral side of things, the sense of fairness, and really which I do not believe they have. It's the other chimp. And I should say, if any of you have seen Franz de Waal's famous video of the kombucha monkey throwing the cucumber out of the cage, that study does not replicate. Six different labs have failed to replicate it. We haven't replicated it. So in any case, you should delete that one from your knowledge stores. Uh, so this is them collaborating, but notice that uh, we have divided the food for them ahead of time. They don't have to worry about sharing the spoils fairly. They can use one another as social tools and get by just fine. In this situation, the chimpanzees help each other. Now, being tricky psychologists, we put the food in the middle. The two chimps still help each other. Now they've got the problem of dividing the spoils. The one you're seeing is dominant. The other one knows that she's dominant and is therefore unenthusiastic. So hold the rope and one of them pulls the blanket. And this is highly predictable. <laughs> but the dominant chimpanzee grabs all the food. Okay, and so this is uh, the, the other chimp, the subordinate chimp stops interacting. They, there's no, um, uh, it, it stops right then. There's no stable strategy for doing it. Um, here's some three-year-old children. I'm only showing you the situation where the food is in the middle. I'm not showing you when it's split. Um, and there are four gummy bears in the middle and you'll see them pull together. Both the chimps and the kids get a little bit of on you know, pulling ahead. They know that. This little kid acts kind of like the chimp. He goes over, but he doesn't take them all. And even three-year-old children know that two and two. They know that that's equal, and they know that anything else is not equal. This child comments they're not on my side, but then comes over, starts to take more of them. The other child says, no. And they take two apiece. All right. In this study, the children took equal number, two apiece, almost every time. And when they didn't, when one of them started to take more, the other one would protest and the other guy would relent every time. So this is what I would call um, uh, resentment. This is a reactive attitude of the type that Strawson first introduced into moral philosophy, at least to my knowledge. Um, uh, and they are expressing their resentment that um, you took more than your share. Uh, you're showing me a lack of respect. Um, I, I believe that um, Adam Smith glosses resentment as um, uh, I don't deserve to be treated in this way. Um, and, uh, and so here is where we see the first normative structuring of collaborative activities. So there's the normative structuring here um, that we uh, make a, a joint commitment to one another. And there's a normative structure here um, where we share fairly. So I would say by the time children are three years old, they have something like this structure. This is something like the psychological structure that I wanna talk about as shared joint agency. They have a joint goal like pulling something in, joint attention to the things relevant to the joint goal. But at the same time, you have your role, I have my role. You have your perspective, I have my perspective. Um, and so I've called this the sort of dual level structure of shared intentionality. And I believe it's actually the, the, the home of normativity. I have a recent chapter on this where um, normativity is about negotiating our shared 
goals and our shared beliefs uh, with regard to our individual perspectives and our individual roles. Now, notice that these children, um, in, in, a lot of times the children in the studies that I just uh, was showing you, the things like this, uh, they didn't do it here. He just said no, but they protest ordinarily. They say, no, you can't do that. You have to do this. You have to share it. So they are using normative language. Now, this is important because if they just say, I want my share, uh, or I want some, I want more, then it's just a personal preference. But at age three, for the first time, I've called it the normative turn, uh, they start using normative language in these cases. And I can show it to you here. Uh, this one doesn't have subtitles. Uh, the child has learned how to play this game. So this is not a moral norm. This is a game norm. A, and, but the child is not participating. So it's uh, he's just watching. And he knows how to play this game called daxing. No, it doesn't go like that. It said, no, you can't. It doesn't go like that. It doesn't go like that. Okay, not at all. Okay. Apes don't do that at all. And I just want to show you one more where we really get the normal language. This one has subtitles. So again, this is a game, and you don't need to know the specific rules of the game. Uh, you just need to um, see that. Now we're using the language of right and wrong. Okay, so we have the language of right, wrong, and cheating. Uh, we've recently done a cross-cultural study. Some people think that uh, there's uh, hunter-gatherer cultures don't do norm enforcement. They do. Uh, so this group-minded psychology, this collective intentionality, collective agency that emerges at three to four years of age involves an understanding of conventions, norms, and institutions, um, institutional reality. Uh, they start understanding those things, distinction between subjective and objective, between appearance and reality. They understand false beliefs as not the normative ideal of the objective situation and socio-moral normative added thoughts and attitudes, obligations and deontic attitudes of all types. So this is the transition into collective intentionality and agency, I should say. So if you sum across both of the, the joint intentionality at nine months and um, collective intentionality at three years, this is the kind of what I've focused on as uniquely human psychology that comes from shared agency. There may be other aspects of human psychology that are unique, but all the ones that are most important to us involving rationality and morality are coming from shared agencies. Joint attention, common ground, we have shared realities. We have to coordinate those with perspectives and roles. Uh, I, I actually believe that chimpanzees do not understand a role. A role means I'm playing one part and you're playing another part in the same activity. Perspectives mean you and I are, look, are looking at the same thing but you from one perspective and I from another perspective, I don't think they have that because I don't think they have the shared agency, shared intentionality structure, the dual level structure. Mentally recursive inferences, I didn't talk about that, but I've studied quite a bit these kind of uh, communicative inferences. I know that uh, Grice is a name that draws a lot of reaction from people, but I think they're Gricean uh, communicative intentions and conventions, norms, and institutions, including linguistic symbols and constructions and objective and normative thoughts and attitudes. So all of these things that are of most interest to most psychologists and philosophers about human psychology, all of these things I believe are coming from the uh, evolution of the capacities to form shared agencies. I wanna emphasize um, a lot of people who aren't used to evolutionary thinking, and there are some people who use evolutionary thinking in, in, in poor ways. This does not mean that if it's evolved, that it's hardwired. I believe what evolved are capacities. We can go back to Aristotle and, 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 and potentiality versus actuality, if you want. It's a category. These are capacities. A child on a desert island, if a child was raised outside of all social interaction on a desert island by himself and somehow miraculously kept, miraculously kept alive, they would not develop these things. 
What they are born with is a capacity to interact with other human beings in ways that enables them to construct these things. You're not going to construct joint attention if there's nobody else in the world to jointly attend to things with. You can't form communicative conventions if there's nobody there to form a convention with. Uh, you can't think about different perspectives only on your own. There again, I adopt a kind of a Davidson triangulation view of this. Uh, the notion of objectivity comes from a social triangulation. Uh, and of course, you're not going to have social, social and moral norms if you're on this island by yourself. So, you're, so it's just like we're born with the capacity to see the world visually with our eyes and all the capacities that go with it. If we are raised in complete darkness, uh, that's going to atrophy, and we're not going to be able to see things if we see light for the first time when we're 20 years old. So by saying these are evolved capacities, I do not mean that they're hardwired, that they're genetically determined or anything like that. They're capacities that the individual in their agency, in their, ontog their ontogeny of their agentive action, including in shared agencies, is going to construct during ontogeny. So to conclude, I will just say that I believe that the key to understanding the evolution of psychology as a whole, cognition, sociality, emotions, is understanding the evolution of agency. And the key to understanding the evolution of uniquely human psychology in its sociocultural and normative dimensions, especially, is understanding shared agency. So thank you very much. I'd like to remind everybody that after the Q&A this evening, we have a reception planned um, here in this room. And uh, Professor Tomasello has very kindly agreed to stick around for a few minutes uh, in case there are any questions that don't get addressed during the Q&A or anybody wants to talk with him about a follow-up. So we have uh, people available, or pardon, we have people who are asking questions on Zoom via the chat and people here in the room. And we'll sort of try to alternate um, between Zoom, between the Zoom folks and the people in the room, and we'll see how things play out. Um, rather than trying to ask for a cue right now, we'll just each time ask for people to raise their hands, and because we're because we're trying to balance between the room and and the Zoom chat. Uh, but I will try to follow our our usual procedure, um, trying to alternate graduate students and faculty. So, uh, so I'd like now to invite uh, any questions. Usual custom is to begin with graduate students. Kirk, Kirk was a graduate student. Hi. Um, so in your book, you talked a lot about how mammals to a lesser degree and apes to a greater degree can are kind of perceiving themselves as like part of this equation of um, what they're reacting to and that they're kind of aware of their perceptions and their own actions. But then I noticed later in the book that you say that perhaps we should reserve self-consciousness just for humans. And I was wondering if you would like to elaborate on that and if, um, if, if self-consciousness and self-awareness to you mean different things or if that's maybe kind of diverging from agency for you. So I was just curious if you could elaborate on that. Uh, I always feel uncomfortable talking about consciousness because people mean different things about it so much. <laughs> so I would just say in the scheme that I outlined for you, I would say that lizards are sentient creatures. They perceive the world, they attend to things, uh, right? So they're sentient. And now when you get to animals with executive function, like a, like a, like a squirrel or a rat, they are, in a sense, if you will, as you just said, sort of observing their own actions and attention. But I think they're, 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 it, it goes in these layers, right, in the, the executive level and the reflective metacognitive level. So from the executive level, the only thing they're aware of is their actions and attention. So that's uh, the proposal is that that's all that uh, rats and um, squirrels are, are, are conscious of, if you will is their own actions and attention. They're not conscious of their own decision-making because they are deciding things, but they can't get on top of it to look at it. That's the model, right? And then when you get a reflective level, like um, uh, uh, like the um, apes, 
Now you can look at your own behavioral decision making, at your own plans uh, from, from, that, from the metacognitive level, if you will. Uh, now humans throw in, and, and this is probably why I talked about self-reflection in humans, humans throw in this extra dimension that I'm not sure what to do with, but um, uh, we, we are simulating other people's perspective on us. So it's not just that, you know, I see my own, you know, action and attention like a lizard. I see my own decision making like an ape. But I see everything about myself as I imagine another person looking at me from the outside. I adjust what I do based on what I think other people are going to think of me and all that. And we do sometimes use the word self-conscious to mean uh, like, um, you know, I, 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 I was self-conscious that I was wearing the wrong clothes at the party or something. We sometimes use it that way. Um, and so maybe I, I think maybe that's what I'm trying to convey is that humans have this additional social dimension um, uh, that um, that is different, I think, than what the other creatures have. But you're absolutely right that we could certainly say that an ape is self-conscious in the sense that he's aware of his own uh, uh thinking and planning, you know, his own planning behaviors on the executive level. Um, so in that, uh, yeah. So anyway, that, that I, 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 again, I hesitate because I'm not up on all the literature on consciousness. I read the stuff about qualia and stuff and it makes my head spin. Uh, so I don't really um, uh, feel comfortable with the, the, the literature, but um, uh, that's the way this model would view uh, consciousness. Thank you very much. I think that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. So we're going to go to a question from Zoom. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll read it. Okay. Um, so Irene asks, do you feel like these differences exhibited in the later part of your talk are related to food, food scarcity or security? That is, it's more adaptive to be cooperative in larger societies with relatively controlled food sources or methods of preservation? Uh, I would say what the what what most of the people in thinking about human evolution would agree to is uh, I, I would change one word not more adaptive sorry some a, a new chat came in and that one just went off the screen uh, it's not more adaptive um, uh, uh, in in the larger groups but it's more necessary in the larger groups to be more cooperative so in small groups everybody knows everybody. Uh, you know, it's like a family. Everybody knows everybody, and uh, um, we can all keep track of our relationships with everybody. In larger groups, it becomes really important to follow social norms and do all that kind of thing, um, uh, because the, the the sort of more direct face-to-face -face mechanisms of uh, enforcing cooperation are not available. So, um, so I, I do believe that food. Uh, when you say food insecurity, I believe I, I, what I've proposed as a kind of um, 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 original adaptive scenario for humans is when they had to collaborate to get food. Um, chimps mostly get food on their own. There's one exception, but they mostly get food on their own. They travel in groups, but then they get it on their own. So humans had to work together to get their food. So it's, it was important for them to cooperate to get food in the first place. And now, as you're saying, when you get to larger societies, I think um, uh, uh, it's easier to cheat, uh, and therefore, cooperative new cooperative mechanisms have to come into place. So, uh, yeah, that's that. Um, um, yeah, that's what I would say about that. Okay, um, Kirk, you had your hand up before. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, uh, I've talked covered so much uh, that it's hard to know uh, where to start, but I guess um, maybe I'll uh, come back into it later to talk about some of the later uh, stages in the evolution of agency, but I wanted to ask a question about the step from uh, lizard agency to squirrel agency, and um, this is really a question about um, how to characterize uh, the step up. And you, you characterize the, the lizard agency as coal directed and the squirrels as intentional agents. And uh, I was just wondering whether that put the finger on, on the right thing there. 
So here's why I was thinking um, might be a, a different way of, of identifying the crucial difference. Um, as I think about intentions, they represent a pro-attitude, which is a commitment to action as distinct from pro-attitudes like desires, which don't themselves um, represent commitments to action. And even desires to perform actions are not themselves intentions unless they are functionally um, designed to lead directly to action, other things being equal. Uh, and so it looks as if that kind of um, functional structure would be present in the lizard. It's got uh, a simpler decision than an either or decision where um, there's you know do A or do B rather than just do A or do nothing. But there's still a, a decision. And the go decision represents a the formation of a pro-attitude, which is a commitment to absolute commitment to action. So that looks sort of like it's a, an intention or a proto-intention or something like that. And I thought the thing that, that you identified in the case of squirrels um, was a form of means and reasoning, which okay. isn't present in the case of of the, the lizard. So thinking about what being able to con conceptualize uh, there being things to do in order to achieve further ends. And right. then that's the then the basis for comparing options. So um, maybe means and reasoning is a kind of conceptual advance there that distinguishes the lizards from the squirrel up. Uh, that's great, Kurt. Thank you very much for that. And I agree with everything you said. Um, you notice that when I was talking about that, I mentioned operationalization in the child literature numerous times. <laughs> and the reason is because um, people have talked about, let's, say, let's take a young infant, four months old, and you dangle some keys in front of his face, and he goes like this, right? All right, and then, and then he grasps them. And the question is, is he acting intentionally? And what the, uh, there's all kinds of debates about it several decades ago. And what people ended up doing was saying, well, when it's really clear, if the means in reasoning, where you have the end in mind ahead of time, and then you're thinking about what means to get there, is when you have an obstacle, right? That's when it's clear. I'm not saying that that's the minimal, you're, you're, you're being more um, analytic and, and, and minimal about it, but, but where it's very clear is when uh, I know that to get this thing, I've got to move this first. So I had a conservative definition of intentional action to involve uh, one action embedded as a sub-procedure in another one as evidence of means end reasoning. Uh, but you definitely could call, I mean, um, you know, in the, in, the old, in the cybernetic literature, they used to call thermostats intentional systems, right? Because they're pursuing goals. So yes, in the broad sense of intentional, uh, then uh, I agree with you. And I was I'm, uh, means end reasoning is a more precise way of characterizing what I mean by intentional. So I, I agree with you totally. Okay, interesting. Um, so Hello? Okay, I'm reading the next question from the chat. Ina asks, the development of joint attention requires some other basic functions that develop prior to that. What would be those functions in your model? I'm asking, uh, I'm basing my question on thinking about Baron Cohen's theory of mind model. Um, so I would, I would say the following prerequisites. One is you have to be an intentional agent yourself. And it's no accident, I think, that nine months is the first age where children actually remove obstacles. So the means and reasoning that we're talking about um, in, in that case is about nine months. And that's the age at which they understand others as they start doing all these triadic things like joint attention, but also imitating actions on objects, uh, following gaze direction. So all kinds of triadic things um, uh, start at the same age they themselves are becoming intentional agents. And so you, in theory, um, could keep those separate. And I think chimps do. So a lot of our research on chimps is showing that they understand others as agents. They understand that others see things. We have experiments showing that they know when somebody sees something and when they don't. Uh, they know that others have goals. Uh, they react to the other person's goal, not to their actions. And when they're having an accident or, or a failed attempt, they know what the person's trying to do, even though they're not doing it. So chimps understand others as agents and they're agents themselves. So a further prerequisite that 
is, um, I think, necessary. You can see in very young infants, starting at about two or three months of age, what um, Colin Trevarthen has called primary uh, uh, intersubjectivity proto-conversations. Maybe I should use that word. Primary uh, uh, proto-conversations that you don't really see in apes. So if you look at a mother uh, or a, a parent and a child of four months or something, the mom is quite often going, oh, coochie, oh, yeah. and the child is going back, oh, yeah. Right? And, and people have shown that um, uh, there is what's called emotional attunement. So the mom, so it's not imitation because the mom may express a positive emotion in her face and the infant responds with a positive emotion in their voice. <laughs> so this sharing emotions uh, is something that is unique to humans, I believe. Uh, there is one researcher, Kim Bard, who believes that uh, chimps do it too, but I disagree with her. Um, uh, and, and so this emotion sharing is not yet joint attention. It's not yet shared intentionality because it's not intentional. Now I mean intentional in the like Britano sense of it's not intentional this way. So um, uh, it's not directed at things. So, uh, so you need to be an intentional agent. You need to understand others' intentional agents and you need to have some notion of sharing, which I believe in, uh, starts with emotions, which are more kind of direct. You know, there's emotional contagion and all these things like that. So it's more direct. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. This was really interesting. Um, I was on board until you got to the point of joint agency and uh, probably for different reasons than a lot of other people would be. So uh, I wanna say that my dogs have joint agency and it seems like if I was understanding you correctly, you would think that they don't on this model. And Okay, so I'm I'm sort of curious because fortunately I was recently at home in Illinois with my dogs uh, and was able to interact with them in ways that I think sort of demonstrates a similar thing to what you were uh, revealing with the kids in terms of uh, sort of interacting with the other in a sort of appropriate way. So I'll notice when I'm playing fetch with my dog, uh, that's a, a shared behavior. We're both paying attention to the same ball. We both have roles that we're playing regarding the ball and uh, the dog will drop the ball for me uh, and knows that they're doing that wrong. Um, and uh, interestingly, my dog, if she puts the ball down on the ground, she wants me to kick it. And if I don't do it after a certain amount of time, she will look at me and then she'll start moving towards me, like notice me, notice yeah. what's going on right now. Uh, and for instance, if I take them for a walk uh, and I'm telling them like, no, the pace needs to be slower. So I yank on the leash a little bit. They look up and see if anything's going wrong. They look me in the eyes. Okay, you, okay, I appreciate that very much. And we've done a lot of studies with dogs and my former, um, uh, my former PhD and student and postdoc, Brian Hare is the world's expert here at Duke is the world's expert on dog behavior. There's a short answer and a long answer. The short answer is this. Your brilliant dogs don't do this with other dogs. That's the short answer, okay? This is uh, uh, a, a process of domestication where dogs have been genetically selected to cooperate with humans. Uh, they, first of all, were, there's a lot of people talk about the domestication of dogs as involving two phases. The first one is just becoming gentler and nicer and more cooperative in that sense with humans. Uh, way back a long time ago, where they hung around the village, and the ones that 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 bit the kids got killed, probably eaten, okay, and the ones that were nice got kept, so they became gradually nicer. But then there's a second stage in 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 the domestication of dogs, and that has to do with herding and hunting. So the, they have they have been genetically selected to cooperate with humans in uh, hunting. There's actually studies with hunter gatherers showing that when they go hunting with dogs, they are something like 40% or 50% more successful than if they don't hunt with dogs. Um, and then uh, subsequently uh, herding, uh, herding sheep and whatnot with the, the famous uh, uh, sheep dogs of various kinds. 
So this is indeed, uh, I would not uh, try to um, uh, uh, um, disavow the idea that, that, that they're cooperating with humans. I would probably be a little bit uh, careful about calling it shared intentionality, but still they're definitely cooperating with humans in ways that other animals don't. Uh, but this is not a naturally evolved um, capacity that they uh, do with other uh, others of their kind, but a domestication process where they've been selected to do this with humans in particular. So again, my colleague Brian Hare likes to make a really big deal about you know these are the two species that have really evolved to be uh, to 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 grow up in human culture and to cooperate. Um, other domesticated animals have to some degree, but dogs are the ones that were really specifically selected to collaborate in hunting and herding. That's absolutely fascinating. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'll read another question from the chat. John says, thank you, Professor Tomasello, for the interesting talk. I'm a fan of your work regarding the evolution of human morality, and I've assigned the book in many in my courses on moral psychology. I'm wondering, do the ideas you've described today change your theory of human morality? Or does your theory of agency merely, if you will, push the evolutionary thread farther back in time before primates without changing your theory of human morality? Thanks again. Uh, no, I have not changed my theory of human morality. Uh, and, and the pushing back the agency, I don't think um, uh, um, uh, affects that directly at all. Um, I will say that, again, I was asked to write a chapter on uh, normativity uh, by some philosophers, and um, I ended up saying that that the, the evolutionary starting point for normativity is goals, because goals are imagined states of affairs that are desirable, that one that, that have value, they're, they're valued imagined states of affairs, and you can be you know, correct or incorrect uh, or successful or unsuccessful um, in meeting your goal. So no, they're not, um, uh, they're not normative in the, in, the, in the sense that people typically use the term, but I think it's the starting point. You have ideal states of affairs that you desire to be the case and you can be successful or unsuccessful in pursuing them. So, so that's the only sense in which this affects the morality is that, is that we're looking at this very uh, instrumental uh, um, uh, version uh, of, of a normative normativity uh, as we're looking at its starting point, but it doesn't affect the idea, the, the, the proposal that um, that human morality um, uh, comes out of the shared uh, shared intentionality, shared agency and intentionality. I should say that I mostly use the term shared intentionality because that's the term that was mostly used um, in various by various people in the field. Uh, but uh, shared agency, I mean, Kirk uses the term shared agency. Uh, Michael Bratman has a um, 2014 book called Shared Agency. So I just think shared agency is looking at it from the behavioral side and shared intentionality is more the psychological and cognitive underpinnings uh, that support shared agency. Okay, we're looking at questions in the room now. Could I just get a sense of how many people have questions? they'd like to ask? Okay, Fritz. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, like John, I'm also a big fan of your work um, coming from a field far away. Um, so my question concerns the concept that you do not mention, but that could be uh, that fits in my mind well into this discussion, which is the concept of shared experiences. Um, Young children, of course, they do a lot of things, but they are also very interested in storytelling, already infants um, in the moment they have the language capacity, and also theatrical play. Um, and so I wonder whether the notion of the possibility that humans can share experiences, can uh, retell past episodes in their life, but they can also react to knowing that someone else has experience in something. I mean, they see expertise in them or having gone through that, whether that is not an alternative path to some of your key concepts of roles, normativity. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I have actually used the term shared experience in some cases to, to be a more inclusive term. Um, and uh, we have studies showing that even kids younger than the ones you're thinking about um, 
know when they share experience with someone. So for example, um, here's an, an experiment the, the child is playing with a teddy bear with one person. And then that child plays with a toy duck with another person. So this is the teddy bear person that I shared teddy bear with. And this is the duck person that I shared the duck with. And then they go into another room and there's a picture of a teddy bear and a duck on the wall. And if they go in that room with the teddy bear person, they point to the teddy bear and say, oh, look, <laughs> okay. And if they go in with the duck person, they say, oh, look. So they know uh, what they have jointly attended to previously with that person. And we can call that shared experience. They know what their shared experiences are. I've often called it common ground. That's the literature. That's the term used in the communication literature quite a bit. And then what you're talking about, where you're talking about, you know, narratives and, and autobiographical uh, reports and stuff, that's, that's shared experience on still another level where they actually will, re, um, uh, you know, uh, make active efforts to share experience uh, of all kinds. Um, and those personal narratives, uh, you know, start at more like age, close to age three or so. But I absolutely believe, I just haven't chosen to emphasize that word, shared experience, but I would say, Joint attention is a form of shared experience. Common ground is a form of shared experience. Um, when you get to one of the things that's characteristic of the collective intentionality level is that we know we share experiences even though we haven't personally experienced them together. Uh, Herb Clark, the psycholinguist calls it cultural common ground. So you and I have never discussed Donald Trump, but I know that we share knowledge of him because you can't miss him if, you, if you're in this culture you can't miss him and i'm guessing since we're both academics we probably share some similar attitudes to him so these are this is a shared experience this is me inferring shared experience from our common cultural uh experiences i mean the english language uh, you know um, we we grew up at least at some point uh in in the same language we share the same conventions so, so conventions and social norms and stuff are things that we share with other people in our culture. And we know that just by any kind of cue to their cultural membership, uh, even though we haven't necessarily experienced it with that person as an individual. So that's part of what I mean by collective intentionality is that we share these things um, just by virtue of being members of a group. And, and we can be wrong about that. Uh, it's possible you haven't heard of Donald Trump, but uh, we, we could be wrong about that. But, but there are inferences we make every day when we meet people that are clearly from our culture and we just assume they share a lot of stuff with us. Thank you. Okay, we're going now to the Zoom chat. Thanks. All right. Tom asks, do you think that chimpanzees don't show these types of behaviors because they're completely unable to under any circumstances or simply that they are biased against being able to, but if raised exclusively in an intensely interactive human social environment, as if they are human children, they could show incipient shared agency? Uh, that experiment has been done. <laughs> they didn't measure shared agency exactly, but there have been three or four instances of humans who've raised chimpanzees uh, in the human home. Uh, I'll tell you one anecdote that I think captures a good bit of it is um, the very first one was, ra was raised by um, um, <clears throat> Kellogg and Kellogg, and they raised a chimpanzee named Gua with their son named Donald, and they wanted to give them similar experiences. So they even slept in the same bedroom in bunk beds, and they raised them all exactly the same and after a couple of years of this, uh, they were hoping that the chimp would become like the human child. And instead their son, Donald, started going hoo, 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 hoo. And, and, and they stopped the experiment, <laughs> sent the chimp to the zoo. So, um, uh, so it, it actually went in the opposite direction. So, uh, so uh, and, and, and Sue Savage Rumbaugh's raised Kanzi and whatnot. So they can do a lot of things. When humans raise them, they can do a lot of things. Uh, uh, but I don't think they engage in uh, any in shared intentionality, that, that they engage in joint goals. Um, maybe this is too high a bar, but for, for sure, you don't see them, for example, um, making commitments, uh, normative protest when somebody does the wrong thing, 
apologizing, making excuses if they don't live up to their end of the bargain, making promises. So none of that normative stuff that normally goes along with it, do you see anything like it? And, and I view the normative attitudes as like the glue that holds together, uh, certainly uh, shared intentionality from age three on, and from age 18 months to three years, there's something like that going on. It's not fully normative yet, but it still um, uh, has uh, uh, a shared intention, intentionality glued together by mutual trust, mutual expectations, and so forth that are in the direction of normativity. So, no, I think I think that no amount of human experience could um, could lead them in that direction. And the previous question about dogs, uh, you know, uh, possibly if you raised large groups of chimpanzees and selected out the most cooperative ones. Um, generation after generations, so maybe you could get there. I don't know, um, but um, I think the, the, the human root was that the the ecology, the feeding ecology, forced them to collaborate uh, to get food or else perish. So individuals who were not good cooperators were weeded out. So that was the uh, process. So if so if if, um, if you and I collaborate to to catch an antelope and then you hog all the food, then I don't select you as a partner anymore and nobody else does either because I tell all my friends. And so then you don't get any food. So humans were absolutely selected, uh, both natural selection and what they call social selection by partner choice. Humans were selected, genetically selected to have capacities for collaborative activities, joint intentionality, um, and chimps have not been down that route. And I, so I don't think human experience, I, I don't think uh, the experience of an individual in a lifetime uh, can do that. They need to be genetically predisposed, so they need to go through uh, um, a process. Okay, uh, Zara. Hi, um, yeah, my name's Zara. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, so I was interested in uh, what you were saying about the dual level structure of joint action. And one thing I'm thinking of, especially um, in relation to some of what you said about dogs and other stuff you said um, during this discussion is maybe the idea that it's more like a tri-level. It's not just that I'm able to recognize like our shared, um, you know, intention and also my goal, like my individual goal, but also I'm able to identify that you're like a suitable partner. Um, so I have some a capacity to recognize your competence or your values. It's not just that we're members of the same group, but that you're a specific kind of member of, of my group or something like that. So I'm curious about what you think about that. Uh, I think uh, you just reconstructed a, an argument that's in my book. <laughs> so absolutely, I agree with that. I didn't get into that, but uh, I, would, I, I actually um, uh, framed it slightly differently. So the dual level is you and I have a shared goal to do something together, and I have my role and you have your role, focusing on the action level. But the way I said it, which I think is equivalent to what you were saying, is I have the option to uh, opt out. I don't like you. I don't want to collaborate anymore. I've got other plans. So I still have my individual rational choice of whether to cooperate or not. And as you said, it can be based on my judgment about you as a good partner or whatever, or maybe I'm just tired. I want to go take a nap. So I can have my, my individual judgment, but then once we engage collaboratively, now I've got the dual level of the joint goal and the individual roles. So actually I have a three level diagram in the book on agency, uh, trying to say that human, once you get to shared agency, you have in, in essence, three agencies, three sets of goals anyway, my individual rational goal of whether I wanna cooperate or not, my joint goal with my partner, and my individual role goal of how I play my part. So absolutely, tri-level um, is, is absolutely accurate. Thank you. Going now to Zoom. Um, I'm not sure. Yes, we're on. I hear Thank you. Me. All right. Abe says, the layered picture of cognitive development seems to involve, uh -oh seems to involve additional complexity and sophistication at each subsequent layer. This might suggest for that, for example, the capacities involved at later stages inevitably must come later because it's more complex. However, we were tracing a particular evolutionary lineage and ignored insects and vertebrates, octopods and birds. 
If we trace a different lineage, might we have a different layered picture? For example, might we have joint agency coming before reflective agency? A very interesting question. I mean, I um, um, birds and insects are obviously the the um, the interesting cases here because they're so social. Uh, you know, E.O. Wilson himself has on the book. You know that the the the, the biggest and best cooperators on the planet are um, the eusocial insects, bees and ants and termites and humans. So we definitely share that. And birds. Um, if you look at the ones who are doing all the clever things of people uh, who, uh, Nikki Clayton stuff on the caching of theory of mindy stuff in, in uh, scrub jays and stuff, they're all the highly social species of birds also. So um, I do think that there could easily be a different trajectory, a different lineage um, uh, to some degree. But I will say that the way I have laid it out, um, uh, there are some things that are, as you say in your question, some things that are necessary before other things can be built. You know, you can't build the third floor of a building until the second floor has been built. So to the degree that that is true, then something like this trajectory is kind of just endemic to its architecture. However, I could easily imagine and especially with, you know, um, uh, the, you know, if you if you read the. Um, I'm having another name blockage on the octopus, um, Godfrey Smith on the octopus, uh, they're on a different plane altogether. I have no idea how to describe octopi, right? And so I took the I took the the easy way out and just said they're not on the line to humans. I'll leave them up to Jeffrey. But um, uh, I could imagine, especially in vertebrates and the octopi, have all these ganglia out in their arms and stuff. They, it's like they have eight brains or something. I have no idea how to characterize those guys. Um, birds are still vertebrates, and I would propose that it's likely that they are also intentional agents. I have my doubts about uh, rational or reflective agency, um, but insects are invertebrates, and they separated off so long ago, they clearly are goal-directed agents and what more they have, I don't know. And if and I, I'm very open to the possibility that you'd wanna have a different architectural construction altogether. Um, but from the Cambrian from the Cambrian explosion on, uh, whatever it was, five million year, 500 million years ago or something, if, if I'm wrong about, if I've got my numbers mixed up, you can correct me, but the Cambrian explosion, we start getting all, all the creatures that are bilaterally symmetrical. So they they are symmetrical, you know, left and right. If they have limbs, they're symmetrical. Um, and if they don't have limbs, they have a front where the food goes in and a back where the food goes out. Um, you know, I say in the book that with vertebrates, it's like control system architecture is like the backbone. It's the thing in common to all of them. It's the bow plan. The basic bow plan is the backbone. So when you have invertebrates, um, you know, obviously the metaphor doesn't work, but I don't know if it's the same thing or not. But I do think the control system in general, this idea of uh, the organism, if you think of a goal as just a, a perception, if I could use the word desired loosely, a desired perception, I have, a, I, I have an image of uh, what I want the world to look like, and then I behave until it looks like it. Uh, um, I think that is probably endemic to anything we'd want to call intelligent behavior. But maybe I'm just not thinking broadly enough. Hey, David. Thank you. Thank you. I was one I was just wondering where individual prudential agency would fall in here. And by that I'm thinking of an individual's long-term pursuit of a complex and somewhat indefinite goal, something like a conception of happiness, um, into you know um, new situations and something that's being redefined as you're going. Does that require the capacities involved in collective agency or merely joint agency? Gosh. Um... Yes, I, I, I just really am not sure about that. Um, 
I know that people talk about, um, uh, yeah, these long-term things. We humans definitely have these uh, longer-term goals that subsume all these other ones under them to a degree that uh, chimps don't. Chimps do have some planning and other kinds of things, but these long-term things, they just don't. Now, whether that has... Um, uh, whether that needs a dimension of shared intentionality or whether that's more of a prudential, in your words, individual thing, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, we get a lot of our goals from our social world um, and, and a lot of the long-term things we have are cultural, um, you know, part of our culture or things we know are possibilities in our culture. Uh, if you had a child on a desert island, maybe that's, again, I use that as a kind of a thought experiment quite often. If you have a child raised on a desert island completely in social isolation, would they have these kinds of long-term um, um, ongoing pro-attitudes shifting all the time? Would they have those to the same degree? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure, but I, but I don't, I, I, I somehow don't, the way that I've thought of shared intentionality, I don't think of it as necessary for what you're talking about, but it very easily could play a constitutive role there. So I'm sorry, I don't, I don't really, I haven't really thought about that, and I'm, I'm afraid I didn't answer your question. But that, that's just that's great. Thank, thank you. Okay, hey, we're heading now to Zoom, but it's going to take me a little while to get there. Oh, there are no more Zoom questions. Okay. So Vera. All right. Thank you. Um, so I have a just somewhat speculative question. When I think about humanity today and evolution today, to me that just you know raises a whole lot of questions because it doesn't really seem that the fittest survive anymore or at least not. I mean, I just start to wonder what do we mean by fittest? I mean, in some sense, the people that are best adapted to modern society actually don't procreate the most. Like the highest earning people live the longest, but they actually procreate the least. Um, and, and on the other hand, people who tend to die young of lifestyle diseases, such as heart disease um, and, and other things caused by obesity, they, they tend to, you know, have lower education levels and tend to procreate more. So I, I just don't, I, when I think about today's society, I, I have trouble just thinking about how evolution works today. I don't, I don't know in what sense the, the fittest survive anymore. And, and then I wonder, what that means for for your topic so i want to know what that means for the evolution of shared agency and um um agency in general i mean have you do you have any thoughts you talked a lot about the past do you have any thoughts about the future evolution of humanity given that evolution today is just like such a messy messy thing yes well i, I will say this this is not exactly your question but uh, let me let me let me say this that um the situation that I've been focused on, if you show my sort of pictures, is early part of human evolution, meaning up to tens of thousands of years ago. And the situation changed quite a bit with the or origin of agriculture and civilization. Um, and there, instead of going around in little bands chasing the food, you know, we sat down with the food, and now everybody comes to the food, uh, just like all the immigrants today are coming to wherever the resources are. That's where immigrants want to come, of course, that's natural. Um, and, uh, uh, and now we have, uh, unlike the hunter-gatherer, where I can easily cooperate with everybody in my group, because I know everybody in my group, or if not, they look like me, they talk like me, and those guys on the other side of the river, they look funny, they talk funny, they eat disgusting things, you know, so that's the in-group, out-group psychology that we evolved with, and then with the advent of civilization, we're all in it together, um, and we've got to learn how to cooperate uh, with others um, uh, who are different from us, and that's the challenge uh, going forward, is can our evolved capacities for being cooperative within our group uh, adapt to this new situation where people who don't seem to be in our group. Now, now they, they, what is a group in the modern world is complicated, but they don't look like me or talk like me. Uh, uh, can I still cooperate with it? All of us, you know, academics, all of us cosmopolitan types, you know, we have no problem doing it, but a lot of more rural people like you're talking about uh, uh, do have a problem with it. Uh, and their in-group, out-group psychology gets in the, in the way of it. So um, I think that's the major challenge that we've got to uh, we've got to um, uh, we've got to meet. 
And um, uh, I think if, if, if we found more ways to collaborate together, that would help. If uh, there are studies showing that mere exposure is also helpful, and one hypothesized mechanism is that the more you're around people that look different from you and talk different from you, the more you see that really, really we're all the same. And I, and I should say that when, you know, um, when I traveled to Africa to watch chimpanzees, uh, we were out in the jungle with some, they're not hunter gatherers, but they're, you know, they're, they, they don't have any of the modern conveniences or electricity or anything. They're gathering their water and all that stuff. And I'm just impressed with, they have the same sense of humor. They have the same problems with their kids. They have the same, you know, I'm just, you know, we're all the same. So mere exposure is also a helpful way of seeing similarities and collaboration is a way of forming joint goals together and stuff. So um, uh, uh, I, think, I think we need to foster institutional contexts. Uh, we need to create institutional contexts that foster um, more exposure to one another, more collaboration with one another. And that's the, um, uh, that's the ideal anyway. Thank you. Thanks. So I'm going to come back in on an earlier question. I think this is the one that uh, Paul started about uh, whether there is uh, whether there are forms of um, shared intentional agency among non-human animals, and um, there may be some terminological issues here. So uh, I want to say how I'm thinking about it, and then with that in the background. Um, suggest maybe it's not quite so clear. Uh, so um, I distinguish uh, collective action as such from collective intentional action. And collective action, I just think of as there'd be multiple agents in some event of state. Uh, so, you know, there's global warming and we're causing it. So that's an example of collective action, which is not intentional. Uh, not a, you know, the, the group that is composed of all the people who are contributing to that and clearly not showing an intention to do anything together. Um, so we get uh, shared intention. We get um, intentional uh, collective action when those people who are making contributions share an intention. And as um, my account of that is that um, it's a matter of intending that um, there's some plan in accordance with which we do the thing, and yeah. the importance which with which means each of us intentionally acts in accordance with the plan. And I think that actually entails Bratman's conditions and are slightly stronger. I agree and, with that. And so there are some conceptual requirements on doing that, which are fairly sophisticated. You have to have the conception of collective action. You have to have the idea of a collective action plan, which probably is slightly more sophisticated than just collective action because you think of individuals as uh, having roles in uh, making contributions to something. Well, I think it requires means ends analysis, as you were saying before. Yes. Yes, it requires that, of course. Um, and it requires also the uh, concept of others' intentions and then putting that together with the idea that that's something you could yourself embed in the content of your own intention. Yeah. So all that's pretty sophisticated. And it's always a little bit tricky to you know read off behavior whether you know what the conceptual structures are that are generating it um, but there do seem to be um, and this is you know it's far from the areas that I've, I've studied but um, there do seem to be um, you know forms of collective activity among animals and hunting for example um, herd behavior for example protecting young from predators and so on. Um, and, you know, the behavior is compatible on the face of it with the a structure of intentions uh, directed at uh, implementing some kind of collective action plan. Um, it may fall short of that, but it's not quite clear, uh, you know, why, you know, what, what would show that it's not actually present. Okay. And some of the sophisticated stuff that you were talking about with respect to the development of children, um, that could be just something on top of uh, the capacities for forming these intentions directed toward group behavior where the contribution of other themselves uh, directed at the same behavior intentionally where it encompasses everybody. 
uh, yes, this this uh, essentially um, uh, this is kind of the Bratman Gilbert argument, is it not? So Brat Bratman says that the the shared intentionality doesn't require these normative things. A normative is an added on thing, and Mar and Margaret Gilbert says the normative is part of the is constitutive. But I will say this. Uh, let me give you some behavioral things. Um, so collective action is no problem. We got herding behavior. We got you know birds flocking and fish swarming or whatever. It's no problem. Um, uh, a term that I use sometimes is uh, is one from Raimo Tumala, which is um, group behavior in I mode. <laughs> so they're not acting as a we. They're acting as a bunch of eyes in a group. Uh, using others as social tools is another term that I use. Um, so one of the things we see in kids at the very youngest age, and you saw this uh, in the, one of the films, is when things stop going the way I want them to go, because uh, when you stop doing your job, I re-engage you back in. I can say when antelopes are herding and one of them decides not to herd, nobody stops and goes and gets them and says, hey, come on, you're not, you're not with, get with the plan here. And in fact, communication is part of it. And I understand that you may say, well, some of these creatures don't have the communicative capacities to use. They may be extra things. But it is true that a lot of what we see as differences in, in human joint, act, joint uh, let me just say collaboration or joint intentional actions with compared to chimps, is the children, even pre-linguistically, as you saw there, the kids are communicating, they're beckoning, they're pointing. Um, uh, and chimps never do this. When the other guy's not doing his job or, or whatever, they just say, well, stuff happens and they just go on their own. I have a film that I could show you where that happens, where they're collaborating and one of the chimps stops collaborating and the other one tries to do it by themselves. They don't try to re-engage. So re-engagement is one um, observable behavioral criterion. You could theoretically do that without communication, but the major way of doing it is with communication. Um, uh, to coordinate, and the chimps never intentionally communicate to coordinate their actions either. And then you get to the um, to the more normative stuff where I'm upset when you don't do your job the right way, um, and um, uh, um, I, com I, I complain when you do. Um, we, we have um, a, a phenomenon that I didn't show you, but that I find very interesting is if you and I are let's take a Margaret Gilbert type example. You and I agree to go get a cup of coffee together and we're walking over there. I can't just walk off, right? Uh, but if I say, oh, sorry, Kirk, I just remember I have to do something, then I can. So I can take leave. I, 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 um, I signal that I recognize the joint commitment and that uh, I value it. Uh, and I'm sorry to have to break it, but I do. So apologizing on it. I understand you could say that's extra stuff. <laughs> that this is the this is what characterizes the human version. Uh, but I'll just say that chimps and other creatures don't have any of this extra stuff. And so we may have to we can work around for some terminological ways of doing this, but I think calling it joint action or collective action, I can live with that, uh, what the other animals are doing, but then a shared agency or shared intentionality, joint agency and joint intentionality, I do want to reserve for the, the kinds of Bratman type. Uh, uh, we both um, know that we both want to do this together. And, and I think, um, I do think that stuff is um, necessary to call it joint intentionality, uh, and although there may be some, uh, uh, some, um, uh, some stuff before that that's pretty close. I don't want to step anybody's toes, but do I have time to follow up? Maybe not. Six o'clock. Okay. Well, maybe I can informally follow up. Yeah. Okay. So before we break, I just want to make a, a few announcements. Um, first, I would like to remind everybody that uh, in a few minutes, a reception will be set up in the back. So please stick around for that. Uh, second, Professor Tomasello very kindly agreed to stick around to talk with people individually, if anybody would like to, to do that. And Kirk, I hope you'll take advantage of that. Um, to do that, just come up to the lectern. There's another microphone there. We'll turn the camera around 
And so you'll be able to look at his look at Professor Tomasello's image on the screen of that computer. You'll be on the camera that's up there. Um, it'll be much more of a experience of talking you know, face to face. Uh, so last announcement. Um, if anybody here is a tech whiz, I need help figuring out how to make the sound only be up there so that when people are talking one on one, we don't have Professor Tomasello on the speakers throughout the room. Uh, so if anybody's a tech whiz and feels like they could help with that, please come up. OK, so uh, with that, um, please join me in thanking Professor Tomasello for a fascinating presentation. Thank you. Thank you.